so for the rest of our session today, I'm going to go over very briefly just um, a couple issues to think of with um, what I'm going to refer to as design assets. <clears throat> and at that point, we're going to kind of walk through actually opening up a new InDesign document, selecting that IDTT file, and then using it in order to create a design sample. So I'll kind of be guiding you guys through selecting and defining different styles, showing you how to define different kinds of styles in the template. And then that should give you a basic idea of kind of what the designers that are going to work on your books are going to do in the process. Um, <clears throat> we'll sort of, you know, you don't need to follow along exactly. Like if I define a certain style a certain way, I encourage you guys to try something different or experiment with some different fonts. So that'll be a little bit more of a slowdown, kind of like sandbox at that stage, um, just to get a sense of all the different options that the designer needs to go through. But for right now, um, if there's no questions before we begin, we'll take a little detour away from using InDesign and just start talking about design assets. Um, so when I say design assets, I basically mean your images and your font file, which we were just talking about a little bit after the break. So something that I think, well, let's talk about images first. So main issues with images. Can anybody think of, maybe I have three big topics when it comes to thinking about images and three sort of issues that need to be um, if they resolved or considered when looking at the images you're going to use for your book. Does anybody have any idea what some of those issues might be? And this is for print specifically. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. I see, I see two for sure. Resolution, absolutely. And copyright. That's another one. Yeah, the license, making sure that your licenses are correct. Um, and then one other thing that we want to be kind of sure about, and it relates to, you know, this kind of image is okay for the web, and this kind of image is okay for print. So there's something that we might understand or, or might maybe a new term for, for people. Accessibility. Yeah, we can start thinking about like um, if you're using alt text for your readers, that's something. If um, maybe you want to start thinking about color blindness issues that relate to your images as well. But I guess on that point, the other thing I was going to talk about was what color profile your images are. That's something that can affect how it comes out in the printer. And it's things you don't want to necessarily confuse. Some printers, for example, won't accept like RGB images versus CMYK images. Are those terms that everybody's heard at this point? Right. So, you know, both about color mixing, RGB is about light mixing. So you're looking at a screen and it's, you know, mixing light as you're looking at it versus CMYK, where we're talking about four colors used in printing that then get mixed together. So some of your images are going to look different in different color spaces. RGB images are typically a lot brighter. Um, they, you know, sort of allow for more like kind of vibrant colors. If you're looking at them on screen, um, they used to do like a lot of coloring adjustments. That's something that you had to learn because you would look at this like beautiful vibrant teal on your screen. And then when it gets printed, it's like muddy, kind of gross. So there's adjustments that you can make for the different profiles. Um, similarly, if you're working on a, let's say a grayscale book, if you're just printing in black and white, uh, if it goes to the printer, maybe you're looking at a third, uh, profile like, um, like a, which would just be black only. So you might get a warning from a printer that says, hey, we're detecting what they call CMY plates, meaning that the printing is occurring on things that are not just black. And they'll come back to you and say like, there's a problem with the printing. We have to stop until you resolve this issue. So the big three things that we want to think about with images is with the proper size and resolution. Is it the proper, is it properly licensed? And is it a proper color space for your desired output? Um, let's see. And then, uh, Alicia, you bring up another good aspect with, in terms of accessibility. You know, are there other other concerns for these images? In print, pretty much everything we want to be 300 DPI minimum. Although a lot of times printers will go down to um, 100 and or no, sorry, 250 or so. And when I say DPI, it means dots per inch. 
So does anyone have familiarity with this so far? Everyone's kind of understanding? Yeah. Richard, is that a yes or did you want to chime in? No, it's a yes. Okay. Okay. Um, and Carla, just a little bit. Yeah. So there are a couple of really handy tools to kind of determine the resolution and size of your images. One is going to be um, things like Photoshop or Bridge. Sometimes, Elvis, I think you can chime into this as well. You can actually check out the resolution of the images through a PC menu as well. I don't think we can do that on a Mac. But yeah. On a PC, um, there are certain options which we're not going to get into here, but um, you, um, you're able to just click on it and it'll give you the dimensions or give you both um, the resolution and the dimensions of the, of the image. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. And I know we're planning on doing a basic template for you guys, a basic design template that you can use as a base if you choose. And I'll show you a function in InDesign that can help us in vetting this as well. So I'll share my screen here. And we're going to jump to an image. There is a palette in InDesign. And when I say palette, I mean these windows over here and these windows available to the windows as well. Now, the link, now the images are going to be in what's called the length palette. So I'm going to select my length palette right here. Because in InDesign, we're not necessarily putting an image file into the InDesign. There are options to do that. But most often, we, uh, what we say link to it. So the file is somewhere else, maybe in, a, in an image folder, and we're placing a link to that file so that when we output the PDF, the information gets brought in correctly. Thankfully, this links palette also has other information. For the purposes of the demo, I kept everything RGB, but it shows you, you know, the color profile of it. You can get an idea of the resolution for it. So if we jump to this first one, our figure 1.1, I have an option here to expand the info. And I don't know how easily you see. Unfortunately, it's another one of those things where I can't zoom in here. But it shows the color space RGB, so that should, you know, if we're sending it to the print, you're like, Oop, well, no, I want that to be CMYK. Um, it also shows the effective PPI. So same thing as DPI, effectively 332. So that's good. Now this one, we see it's at 192. So we know there could be pixelation that happens in the print. It wouldn't be a high quality image. Uh, there's something that we could do to sort of like vet this beforehand, maybe using a different piece of software like Adobe Bridge. But at this point in InDesign, these are ways that we can identify problem files. And there's another handy tool that I'm going to show you that will be very helpful um, next week when we go to the idea of TypeSec QC, and it's called a pre-flight. So pre-flight, kind of, I don't actually know what the um, origin of that term is, but it's effectively a way for us to review a document and look for problems before it goes to the printer. I always think of it as like a type, you know, like a, like a pre-flight checklist, like making sure that you have fuel, making sure that your plane is okay. And there's different options that we can build into this. So one of them that we're going to build in for this basic template, um, we'll make an OTN profile. And I'll just kind of show you different options here. So in the pre-flight tools, we can tell it to look for a lot of different things. We can tell it to look for as it thinks, we can tell it to look for specific um, image issues. We can tell it to look for maybe links that are missing. So if your typesetter links to a file and then sends it to you and doesn't send you the images, then you're going to get a lot of these warnings that say, like, oh, I don't have that file, like the link is missing. So that's a pretty typical built in one because the issue that occurs there is if your typesetter doesn't send you all these assets, now, if you didn't provide them to them, then you output your PDF. And it's you know low resolution. It, the PDF is just built with the preview in InDesign, so you end up with some bad image problems. We can build in color warnings so that it doesn't allow for you know RGB images, or rather, not doesn't allow for, but has a different. Okay, go away. No, I'm in basic. Okay. We can look for issues like well, I'm printing in black and white, so cyan, magenta, and yellow space aren't allowed or I maybe don't want to allow for things like Pantone colors. Um, Pantone colors, real quickly, is just a system of color numbering where there's a specific ink that's used. Sometimes if those are in the actual file, 
you might get a note for the printer that says, hey, this is built with like Pantone 250 and we don't have that. So you need to turn it into a CMYK value. Um, some other issues that it can look for, it can look for image resolution problems. It can look for transparency issues if you're concerned about that. It can look for bleed and trim hazards. Um, I would not know when I say bleed and trim, like is that a new term for anybody? Feel free to let me know and I'll, I'll talk about it now. So it's a very quick sort of idea. Um, basically just new, okay. So a bleed issue. Go away. Discard? Yes, I do. So I'll discuss bleed right here because we have actually have the issue built in. So here's a full color image that extends all the way outside the edge of it because we want the color to extend to the edge of the page. Now, the issue is that maybe the printer's blade cuts here, maybe it cuts here. So if it cuts here, and I just built this a rectangle to the edge of the trim, I'll show you what that looks like. So maybe the printer's blade cuts here. Can everyone see that line, that kind of dotted line? So maybe it cuts there. Well, what's gonna happen in this space here? It's gonna be a little white edge because it's just gonna print on the paper. So what I need to do if I want a full bleed object is I want to extend this further than it's allowed. So then the actual paper printed out is printed onto up to this point. So if the blade cuts here or if it cuts here, it's okay because I'm going to have that color go all the way out to the edge. So what those bleed and trim hazard warnings are going to do is if you have something that goes there, for example, the pre-flight is going to flag it and point you to that problem and say like, hey, you have an issue here. You know, this could be a problem. Just like our QC checklist, it's things that if they draw your attention. It may or may not be a, a legitimate issue, but it's still gonna draw your attention. So essentially, with this pre-flight tool, we're gonna build in a lot of these things like color, resolution, warning issues, so that if you have them in your book, and I'll go to my pre-flight, so that if you actually have any issues, they're gonna pop up. So here's, you know, color spaces is not allowed. Here's, you know, um, CMYK plates not allowed. So I have it on the bracket block on my profile. So now I see image resolution pops up four times. It's very easy to select and double click these and jump right to resolution images. Now, this is nice in the back end. Ideally, you're gonna resolve this early on. And that's where things like an art log come in handy. So when it comes to image organization, sometimes something like this is very helpful. Um, you can do this using the hub. There was that section that we looked at in the hub where it listed all the images that are used in the book and called out. So we can copy and paste that and then put them in a column here. And essentially what we do is we have the image name, you may have a short description, you may have you know, an example like a note to yourself or to your client and then whether it's resolved or unresolved. So if this was a, you know, a resolution problem, we could say, hold on, image 2.7 isn't okay because we have a resolution problem. So we know it, we can see that it's resolved or unresolved. And then to Kathy's earlier point about image organization, we always kind of recommend that you name files kind of according to how they're used. So I don't know if everyone can see the file names down here, but we're naming them, you know, figure 1.1, figure 1.2, so that you don't have this huge string of letters and numbers that maybe the author grabbed or something like that. So those are the main things we want to look at for images. We want to look at for resolution, color space, and licensing. Licensing I didn't get to into because that is a bit of a separate issue, but we want to be sure about it at this point so that no one you know, grabbing photocopied maps from National Geographic and putting them in their textbooks in the worst case example. Um, and there are a couple spots that we can put in to kind of account for those issues, pre-flight and InDesign, and then keeping an art log to maintain some organization. Um, questions about images so far? I 
I will stop sharing as well. A lot of it I feel like goes into what we were discussing, you know, this whole this whole time. Being being organized, making sure everything's accounted for, and trying to answer these questions as early into the process as possible. Um, okay, let's see. So I'm gonna move on to the next little topic here. 